Good evening, sisters and brothers. Delightful to share this time with you and a three alarm fire from Philadelphia named Deuce. <laughs> One time Jesus said, be born again. One time in the Gospels to a guy named Nicodemus who didn't believe it until in Jesus' lifetime. Nobody in the book of Acts thought about saying it again. It was never repeated by Paul. One time, one chapter, John 3, we read, born again. Over 30 times, Jesus said, follow me in the Gospels. It's obvious that discipleship was important. But more than 90 times in the Gospels, we see the word kingdom. One time, be born again. Over 30 times, follow me. Over 90 times, kingdom. This conference has it right. It's about the kingdom. It's not about us. It's not about what we believe. It's about who we follow. And the church is a sign of and an agent for the kingdom. One verse I want to leave with you. Acts 13.1. It's the, the only picture we have of the leadership team in the first church we know anything about. It's a city church. It's called the church at Antioch. And they had five leaders. Trust me, Acts 13.1. I won't bother to read it. The print's too small. <laughs> Barnabas from Cyprus is the glue that put the leadership team together. He's obviously a grace apostle, a risk taker. He's mentioned 22 times in Acts. Barnabas from Cyprus, an island, a Cypriot, a Jewish Cypriot. The next one is Simeon, the, the Niger. Now, the word Niger there is the word Negro. It's the Greek and Latin word for black. A black African was on the leadership team of the church in Asia Minor. The first church we know anything about had an African, a black man, on the staff. The next name is Lucius of Cyrene. Where's Cyrene? It's the north coast of Africa. The guy had to be a Punic or Berber, probably a Berber, say the scholars. A brown man on the staff of the first church we know anything about. The next name is Menaean, who worked with Herod. So a Palestinian politician, huh? Possibly. And so the first church we know anything about had two Africans, one black, one brown. Two Asians, one from Cyprus, one a Palestinian politician former politician. And Barnabas, who put this leadership team together, says, we need a European. And he thought of Paul, a European-trained Jew. It's interesting, the first church we know anything about had three continents on the pastoral leadership team. That's about the kingdom. How did that happen? Well, there are some hoops the earliest church had to go through because they began all Jewish. So let me do this jet trip for a few minutes. The first ethnic conflicts was in Acts 6. Greek-speaking widows were getting discriminated against at the hunger program. Somebody was giving a few more sliced peaches or dates to the Jewish widows. Did you grow up in a family where you counted the, the food as your mother dished up your siblings' dish? I did. And it felt very unfair when my sister got more cherries in her bowl than I did, or more bananas or something like that. Obviously, church fights seldom occur over doctrine. The first ethnic conflict we know didn't happen in a doctrine class. It happened at the hunger program. And what the early church did about that was they changed the constitution. They went out and elected seven Greek speakers to come in and be the leadership team. They pluralized the leadership team. They changed the constitution. They had to include this diversity. That's in Acts 6. Acts 7, the early church leaders went out onto the street and one of them began to preach. And if you study his sermon, he had four points. The first one is all the great acts of God happened outside Palestine. So that's the second lesson they had to learn. That God doesn't just have a little holy land. God is including all the world. There were a lot of Jews that wanted to build a wall around their little country. It was God's favorite country. Like a lot of Americans want to build a wall. This is God's land, no? Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's. 
If he wants to bring the whole world to California, that's God's business. Let him come. It's the kingdom. It's a different perspective. So the early church, they killed this preacher because they couldn't handle his theology. Because he reminded them that the greatest miracles in the Bible didn't happen in their little country. They happened down in Egypt, off the map of Israel. Then the camera swings to Samaria, and the Samaritans were half-breeds. They were Creole, Mestizo. They were half Jewish and half Assyrian, or today we'd say Iraqis. Mixed racial people. The Jews hated them because they reminded of all those wars that they fought against the people today who live in the area near Mosul in Iraq. You hear that name on TV all the time. Nineveh was, the province of Nineveh was where Mosul is today in Iraq. The greatest Bible, the greatest revival in the Bible happened in Nineveh, in Iraq, not in Israel, and certainly not in America. Interesting. And so the Samaritans were included, these half-breeds, in Acts chapter 8. So you can see the church is starting to learn lessons. Now the author of the book of Acts is 100% non-Jewish. And so he's very interested to know if the church can deal with these half-Jewish people. The Samaritans are one group. Then the camera swings down in Acts 8 to show us the sexually altered Ethiopian finance minister. I don't know what you call eunuchs, but I will call him the sexually altered Ethiopian finance minister. This guy was on a business trip. He had read Isaiah 55 that said, when the Messiah comes, eunuchs would be welcomed into the temple. He came 2,000 miles reading the Hebrew Bible, and he saw the sign on the temple said, eunuchs need not apply. He was going back home. But Philip put his arm around the eunuch and welcomed him in. And you see, I asked in Ethiopia, how come this eunuch can read the Isaiah scroll in Hebrew? That's classic Hebrew. How did he do that? And a professor, Tedessa Tamrat, at the University of Addis Ababa reminded me of something. The guy was Jewish. He's from the illegitimate son of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, called Falasha Jews, Ethiopian Jews. There are thousands of them. I've met them. Many are now in the state of Israel. That's why he could read Hebrew. All of a sudden, I realized Acts chapter 8 is two mixed racial cultures. Skeletons in the Jewish closet. The Samaritans who come from Assyria or Iraq, half Jewish, half Iraqi, we would say today, and the black Ethiopian Jew coming out of the closet, this eunuch. Both of them were baptized in chapter 8. At that point, the camera swings on to the conversion of Paul, the next chapter, the biggest bigot in the Middle East. And then he's sent off to Arabia to learn to work with Arabs and non-Jews in, in school. God's grad school is the desert, as you know. That's where Moses went to grad school. God made him practice with sheep in a bad neighborhood for 40 years before he would trust him with people in a bad neighborhood for 40 years. And then finally, you have the climax of the... Pentecost story itself. And this is the second conversion of the Apostle Peter. That is interesting. The Peter, the head of the church. Peter, the evangelist of Pentecost. Peter who saw all the miracles. Peter who walked on water for a little while. Peter who heard everything Jesus said except when he was sleeping in the prayer meeting in the last in the garden. Peter, who denied Christ three times at the cross, but was forgiven at the empty tomb. Peter, the leader, was still struggling with this great theological question, but what if the kids bring ham sandwiches to our Sunday school picnic? <laughs> Peter still thought God was Jewish. He still thought God's favorite people were Jews, that his calendar, his, his culture is more valuable and other people's culture. Some of you know this story, but about 30 years ago almost, my oldest boy brought home a friend from school. We fed him for six months. We finally ended up adopting him. Kid was homeless. Only problem was, I had two kids already, and this kid was named Brian, so now I have two kids named Brian. Uh, one very blonde, who usually comes to this meeting. Some of you know him. And the other is a black kid. So I have for almost 30 years been a black dad and now seven of eight of my grandchildren are black. 
That's a miracle like the virgin birth. There's no way I could do that. <clears throat> Kids introduce my black son who lives in Chicago and say, oh, that's dad's son from a former marriage, but it's not really true. It didn't work out that way. I remember when Brian came into our house, I'm married to a concert pianist. If you know anything about music schools, you know that in music school, God is a European. Angels sing Mozart, Bach, Beethoven. When Brian came to our house, suddenly a new music appeared. Blues, rags, jazz, metal. And then my wife had this very interesting question. Is her music as valuable as his or the other way around? I mean, she had it theologically figured, but deep in her heart, she needed the conversion of her ears. Right? Isn't it interesting that a whole chapter is given over to the racism of the leader of the church? Peter was an ethnocentrist, a cultural chauvinist, a benign racist, the leader of the apostles. And so the highlight of the Pentecost story is the second conversion of the preacher of Pentecost himself. Acts 10, 34, I see it now, he says. Anybody, anytime, any place is acceptable to God. Now Peter was the great preacher, the evangelist, but he was still struggling with these little issues. Not so little, actually. The fact that the leader of the church had to repent of this is a sign of the kingdom. You can be apparently filled with the spirit and still be a cultural chauvinist, an ethnocentrist, and a benign racist. You can lead thousands of people to Jesus like Peter did, and you can still be an ethnocentrist, a cultural chauvinist, and a benign racist. Apparently Peter was. And so Peter's repentance in Acts 10 makes way for the new kind of church to appear in Acts 11, the Pentecost church. And the first message that came to that church was that there were hungry people down in Jerusalem. And so they took the hunger offering and hand carried it to the hungry. Two chapters later, the same church in the heart of that city heard that there were lost people in other cities. So they took the gospel offering. And they took the same two people, Barnabas and Paul, that hand carried the hunger offering to hand carry the gospel offering. You see, the church has to go out to the needy and out to the lost with equal integrity and compassion. The Antioch church did that. By the way, there was no word to describe what that was. No word at all in the language. They had to invent it in Acts 11. You know what the word they invented was? Christian. Christians were first called Christians at Antioch. In other words, to be a Christian is not to walk down the street with a cross around your neck. The word Christian is to be part of a body that's bringing people across cultural barriers from three continents or more and going out to the needy and out to the lost with equal integrity. Right? That's what this picture is. And so in this photo album of the earliest church, we see the hurdles they had to get over. Ethnic conflict, they had to change their worldview in Acts 7. They had to welcome the, the half-Jews because, and this is dangerous, it's often easier to go to Africa to the foreign mission than to go around the zip codes here at home that we don't like. It can never be. Jesus said on the way to the ends of the earth, you go through Judea, Samaria. The Jews had built the interstate highway to go around Samaria rather than go through the half-breed culture. I know a lot of people committed to foreign mission who go around the home mission on the way to get there. The book of Acts is not like that. Luke, who's 100% non-Jewish, the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament, says on the way to me, 100% non-Jew, you better deal with these two other groups, these skeletons in your closet, these half-Jews. And the early church did that in Acts 8. And then gradually you see the conversion of the apostles themselves. And finally the invention of a new word. Because Christian 
doesn't refer to an individual just casually being a Christian. The word Christian is describing the behavior of a community that is welcoming to all the peoples of the city, organizes a leadership team from several continents, goes out to the needy and out to the lost with equal integrity. That is what the church is. The church is not an end in itself. It's a sign of and an agent for a kingdom agenda in the world. That is the inclusiveness of the kingdom. Well, that's heavy, isn't it? Little mouse ran down my street one day. You know how arrogant urban mouse, mouse is? You know, <laughs> solid. Suddenly there was a meow, so the mouse dove into a manhole, or a person hole, is that what you call it now? There was water in this manhole, and the mouse couldn't get down very far, so it landed on a brick, and pretty soon that cat's paw was reaching down there real, just touching the top of the fur. And the mouse was sitting there trembling. The cat couldn't quite get its paws around the mouse, so all of a sudden there was this roar, roar, roar. Up went the paw, patter of a little feet. Mouse was breathing a sigh of relief. Dog came, chased the cat away. So pretty soon he got his courage back and climbed up there and looking around, all of a sudden, whop, and it was the cat. The cat was about to eat the mouse. The mouse says, wait a minute, where's the dog? And the cat said, Mouse, if you're going to survive in the city, you've got to be bilingual. <laughs> For some reason, the Lord of Mission is bringing the nations now to our neighborhoods. Los Angeles is a human zoo. Chicago was also. My neighborhood had, had, neighborhood had 63 nations in the student body where my kids went to school. They were teaching in 11 languages. More than one-fourth of the nations of the world were in one mile square of my neighborhood in inner city Chicago. I, I began to ask, does God know about this? <laughs> the United States has long been the largest Irish nation. We're the largest Scandinavian nation. By now, we're the third largest Spanish nation. There are 25 Spanish countries and only Mexico, which will be here tomorrow, and Spain have more Spanish people. We're the third largest African nation, or fourth largest rather. There are 53 countries on the continent of Africa and only three of them have larger black populations than the United States. We're the largest Jewish nation by far, far more Jews in New York than the state of Israel. Now Arabs outnumber Jews. Does God know about this? Now the people running away from Chicago are running into the people running away from Los Angeles, somewhere near Colorado Springs. <laughs> people trying to get away from the greatest migration in human history, which is the migration of rural to urban, north to south, east to west, and everybody's coming to the city. And if God wants to bring them, there's got to be an inclusive kingdom signing church there. Out to the needy, out to the lost, welcoming, including the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I said it this afternoon in the workshop, but the Christmas story is about an Asian-born baby, born in a borrowed barn, who became an African refugee and came back later to be buried in a borrowed grave. All the village boys died for Jesus before he could die for them on the cross. If anybody understands the pain of crack babies, fetal alcohol damaged kids, HIV infected kids, Jesus understands. His whole village died for him on, on the cross before he could die for them on the cross. You see, you're working with kids in pain, right? Jesus understands that. I didn't invent that story. I just took the stained glass off the Christmas story. It's in the text, folks. And when the plain text makes common sense, seek no other sense. These pictures of the kingdom are real. It is an inclusive kingdom. The Lord is offering forgiveness to all. And just in case the missionaries don't get there and it's very expensive to go there now, he's bringing them here at their own expense. It's the greatest bargain in the kingdom today. The nations are now in the neighborhoods. Only difference is the frontier has shifted. It's no longer geographically distant. It's culturally distant. And so we have to recover the inclusiveness of the kingdom. Are you with me?
It's the gospel, my friend. Don't reduce it. It is the gospel. The Lord who bled and died and wept over the death of his friend also wept over the impending death of his city. You see it in Matthew 23 and Luke 19. How often would I have gathered you unto myself as a hen gathereth her chicks, but you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus saw the multitudes. And Jesus is a photograph of the living God. God wanting to include people and wanting a church to go through all these lessons, wanting leaders to repent of their chauvinism and their racism. And so I say to you, to God be the glory, to the earth be peace, to the youth workers be courage, and to our world be hope. God bless you.